Dr. Yapko, I have to start with thanking you for this great contributions that you're doing for the uh, field of hypnosis. You have taught thousands and thousands of students in all of sorts of different professions. Mm -hmm. And uh, with all your accomplishments, the question is, why teach? Why teach? When you are aware of something valuable, and you have any inclination to want to share, teaching's the most obvious vehicle for that. You know, here is a specific, very specific skill set of being able to do hypnosis. And of course, the hypnosis is embedded within larger therapy. And to become a therapist means that you care about people, you care about uh, wanting to alleviate human suffering and the need of people far exceeds the number of practitioners. So to contribute in the way of increasing the number of people who know how to do these things is just obvious. So I never thought about not teaching. And where do you find resources to keep doing what you're doing? Um, for one, uh, an extraordinary and unwavering passion for what I do. I started uh, in the field of hypnosis more than 40 years ago. I was instantly attracted to it when I saw my first clinical demonstration, which happened to be about pain relief. And as soon as I saw the result, I was only 19, I thought, I have to learn how to do this. And so my interest was great. We're dealing with something that is inherently ambiguous. Uh, hypnosis is still difficult to define, difficult to describe, difficult to delineate in any kind of objective way. And so there's always plenty of room for observation and growth and the curiosity that is probably my strongest uh, trait has kept me engaged with hypnosis my entire professional life. So that's where it comes from. Curiosity, like passion, um, dedication to wanting to do the best that I can do, make as much contribution as I can, um, and seeing the need. How do you see the combination of craft and art of hypnosis developing in the next 10, 15 years? Uh, it's a tough question to answer because every time I think I can predict where the field's going to go, it hasn't gone there. So I'm obviously not very good at making predictions in that regard. I can say where I hope it will go. I'm hoping that the pendulum will swing back in the other direction away from one-dimensional biological explanations for people's problems. I'm hoping that we will get away from these um, heavy emphases on brain science as if that's what's going to explain people's subjective experience. And I'm hoping that we will use our skills to increase some of the best things about people. Generosity, compassion, loyalty. Some of the things that can only get expressed in human relationships. And so relationships over the last 15, 20 years have taken a beating on many different counts. And I'm hoping that we can be a force for a greater social awareness, social connection, highlight the things that can happen in a relationship, especially a hypnotic relationship that just can't easily happen in many other ways. And I'm hoping that the people who are the leaders of the field will help push people in that direction and uh, do a little less biological grandstanding. Okay. I was listening to the plenary today. You were a speaker of American Society of Clinical Hypnosis scientific session mm -hmm. and uh, very interesting presentation on depression. But there was one thing that impressed me the most. It was your ideas on prevention of mental illness. And do you see any role of hypnosis to be used before the problems arise? What are your thoughts on that? 
if you take my previous comments about wanting to emphasize the social side of the equation, we're watching in some ways society unravel, get a little rough on the edges. Relationships have been de-emphasized rather than emphasized. Uh, technology has taken the place of relationships. People that would rather get on a computer to be in a chat room than actually meet somebody for a cup of coffee. And there is a mental health price tag for eroding the qualities of human relationships. And from a prevention point of view, if we can start to encourage people once again to integrate into early childhood trainings, uh, problem solving skills and coping skills, you know, I, I alluded to but didn't really elaborate the huge amount of prevention literature that's out there. And when um, researchers have gone into school settings, elementary school settings, and they've taught even just the most basic problem-solving skills, coping skills, self-regulation skills, and then track these kids. Um, I, I remember one of, the, one of the earliest programs was so impressive to me, and, and programs have just gotten better since then. But one of the earliest programs just involved 24 hours of training third and fourth graders some basic social skills, some basic problem-solving skills, gave them a chance to talk two hours every other week for six months, total of 24 hours. And when they'd come in from recess and they'd say things like, nobody wants to play with me, whoever was there was able to say, nobody, nobody in the whole world wants to play with you and get the kid to say, no, Billy wouldn't play with me. And so their thinking got better. The quality of their thinking, the critical thinking skills got better. And then when they tracked these kids for years afterwards, these kids who went through that simple training had less than half the rate of depression, less than half the rate of drug abuse, less than half the rate of teen pregnancy, and very impressive results for a relatively small investment. And more schools now are opening themselves up to including mindfulness as a part of the curriculum and demonstrating the benefits that go with that. That's prevention. Teaching people how to manage themselves, how to manage their feelings, how to not get lost in the emotions and how to stay focused on problem solving, empowering kids along the way, all has huge prevention value. And the fights that we have ultimately are about money. Uh, teachers who say, I don't get paid enough to be a therapist. School systems who say, we don't have the money to integrate these things into the to school settings. So it's really going to require a societal shift. It's going to require people to recognize that prevention costs much less than treatment. And as obvious as that seems, insurance companies haven't figured that out yet. And uh, a lot of parents haven't figured that out yet. So uh, I, uh, there's no question prevention works. The amount of data is unequivocal. But getting people to learn to think in terms of prevention is really the barrier. And I think we in the field of hypnosis can do a lot more to help people overcome that barrier and start to do a better job of thinking ahead, thinking at least two or three steps ahead of where we are right now. Some things can't necessarily be easily predicted, uh, but a lot of things can be. You know, you, you don't have to be psychic to know that if you beat your kid, that's going to have some pretty serious consequences down the line. You don't have to be a psychic to know that if you call your kid names and, and abuse this kid in a variety of ways that there's going to be some serious consequences for that. But that's uh, what I think that we can do is help integrate these things into um, general information that's on television and radio and in newspapers, contributing articles, helping people grasp that uh, 
prevention is viable, that we have the technology to do it already, that we just need to kind of shuffle our priorities. And, and you know, even now in this political year when we're, we're, you know, we're filming this in advance of the 2016 election, you know, the fact that people are even mentioning in passing more available funds for mental health is encouraging. How long it'll take to actually happen, but the fact that they're even starting to talk about it is encouraging to me. I hope your inspirational words are heard by many, many people, not only professionals, but also people who make decisions and also people who vote and choose, people who do make a difference. Um, you have been very um, influential in American society of clinical hypnosis and has done a lot, plenaries, speaking, teaching. Has American society of clinical hypnosis made a difference for you? Has it influenced you in any way? Um, the short answer is yes. You know, I, I've been a member of this society now for close to 40 years. And in the early days of hypnosis, where the pioneers who have now all passed away were still alive, to have been able to know and spend ample time with the people who define this field and shape this field. Uh, you know, the, the, the big names that I would guess everybody knows from Jay Haley to William Kroger to David Cheek to Kay Thompson and you know, just a, an extraordinary array of people that have uh, been ASH members. To just be in their presence was incredibly inspiring to me, you know, somebody like an Andre Weizenhofer, who was three of the smartest people I've ever known. Uh, I mean, he was just brilliant. And, and when, you, when you sit there and get into in-depth conversations with these people who were so available and so giving and so generous, they were role models. And, you know, you, you can talk about me being a generous force, but I learned from the best. Now, I know you like to do exercises when you teach, and I've seen one today, mm -hmm. but I suggest that we do an exercise, and we do an exercise on a split screen. We're sitting in a comfortable theater, and we have a big screen, and, there, and that screen is split in two. And uh, on that screen, we see future. And you know future can go in different directions. And uh, as it would be a garden, it's a, which grows to be beautiful and giving fruits, or uh, dry, parched, bringing nothing. That's how things in life. And sometimes you know the few decisions can make uh, development go this way or that sure. way. If you were having that power of nurturing future of American society of clinical hypnosis in a way to make a strategic decision at some point, what would be your advice? What should we do to get those green pastures and fruits for all of us to I was, enjoy. I was just talking about this with our new president-elect, Asen Aladdin. Um, by the time people graduate from their graduate programs in psychology, by the time they finish medical school, by the time they start to establish their professional identity, if hypnosis isn't already a part of that, they're not very likely to come to it later when they're already established. So if I had the magic wand, I would work very hard to get graduate students and medical students to start learning hypnosis early on so that it's an ongoing part of their training from the earliest days. I don't think too many are going to come to it later. And so to aggressively get into graduate schools and medical schools would be the number one thing that I would say needs to be done to cultivate new generations of people interested in hypnosis, to inspire people to want to integrate hypnosis into their practice. Once people learn about it in a credible way, they get excited about it. They see what the possibilities are. If you, if you have any interest in empowering people, if you have any belief that people can be more, Hypnosis makes perfect sense, but people just aren't coming to it later. And I think that it's a shame that 
it's not a standard part of the curriculum for any clinical training program in whatever domain it happens to be. So I think that that would be the thing that would inspire new generations, keep the relationship with uh, the society growing and vital, keep membership growing so that it can continue to provide more trainings and more places to bigger audiences, and make it, make it an organization to, to be reckoned with instead of something that seems almost incidental. I'll add a second thing. I'd also really like it when people go through their training, if they were inspired to focus on all the things that hypnosis does really well, instead of people being unnecessarily scared about applying hypnosis. It's just not a uh, great way to inspire people. We, we always want to teach great clinical management skills, but we, I think, really need to emphasize all the great things that hypnosis does and, and not much else. Thank you very much, Dr. Yepko. Congratulations on your book. Thank you. Looking forward to read it and hope to see you more and more in our meetings and Mm -hmm. have a chance to expose your knowledge and uh, experience to more young professionals and attract more professionals to ASH. Thanks, Mariana. Appreciate it.